All right, welcome back to Dinosaurs. We're into the second last week of class. Happy Friday. Probably not watching this on Friday, but I hope you are. Uh, we've only got one week left, so hang in there. We're almost through. Today, we're going to talk about North American uh, dinosaur sites. So some of the localities within North America that we find large quantities of dinosaur fossils. We've been looking a lot at kind of individual dinosaurs and groups of dinosaurs. Today, I kind of want to put that into context and look at them kind of as a community and kind of how we know what we know about the age of the dinosaurs so that we can reconstruct pictures like the ones behind me with uh, some amount of confidence. Before we do that, though, some announcements. OK, uh, and it covers all modules and all topics. All right, so let's review where we were last time. Uh, so we talked last time about uh, the aftermath of the extinction and everything that kind of happens after uh, all the way till the modern day. And we even mentioned a little bit uh, into the future. But uh, one of the things that really defines the Cenozoic, the, the modern era, is the climate. So how does our climate compare to the Mesozoic? Oops, uh, it's not animated. <laughs> uh, good job. Uh, so yeah, it's drier and it's cooler. Uh, excellent. I hope you all got that. Uh, so yeah, the Cenozoic is defined as, at the beginning, uh, it's sort of warm and wet, uh, almost as warm as it was back in the Permian. Uh, but because the continents are now wider spaced, uh, we have oceans between, so it's not as dry as the Permian, but it starts trending towards drier as we go through. And then when we get into the true ice ages, it's very cold and very dry. And mammals are... Uh, fairly well suited to those conditions with our uh, fur coats, our warm blood, and uh, all our other adaptations. Uh, so this one's also not animated. Apparently the animations got stripped off of here. So congratulations, <laughs> the, the chicks live impact. Uh, so which of the following events occurs during the Cenozoic? Uh, the chicks live impact's the only one on there that's not during the Cenozoic. Uh, during the Cenozoic, the Himalayan mountains form uh, grasslands expand. Remember, grasses weren't a thing back in the Mesozoic, or at least not till the very end of the Mesozoic. Uh, instead of grasslands and savanna lands, there were fern prairies or fern savannas. Uh, dinosaurs were mostly eating ferns, uh, not grass. Hmm. Uh-oh, that paleo art looks like that might be grass, uh, but that is pretty late in the Cretaceous, so maybe that's fine. Uh, but keep that in mind that uh, grasses were not a thing until very late in the game in the Mesozoic. Uh, and probably the defining characteristic of the Cenozoic is that even though it starts out warm and humid, uh, nice green and lush, you see the Sahara Desert's not a desert, Antarctica's green, uh, very warm and humid, very little gradation, probably no ice at the beginning. Uh, by the end of the Cenozoic, or I should say towards the end of the Cenozoic, we start getting these big ice sheets, uh, a mile or two thick of ice above our heads here in Oswego. Uh, obviously, they've melted, so we're now into an interglacial period, but that's one of the defining characters of the Cenozoic is the quote-unquote ice age, uh, but just remember that those ice ages were actually a series of uh, ice advances and retreats. That's not actually truly one ice age. There was several glacials and interglacials, uh, mostly because of orbital parameters changing, like the tilt of the Earth, where it's pointed in space, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, okay, well, let's look at a North American dinosaur site. Uh, so the general way that these are going to be configured, uh, and we're going to visit North America today, we'll visit uh, Eurasia on Monday, and then we'll talk about the Gondwana and the southern continents uh, next Wednesday. But the way these are going to be kind of structured is that we're going to kind of start earlier in geologic time, so usually like the Triassic, and then we'll try to find a good example of something in the Jurassic in the middle, and then a good example of a site uh, from the Cretaceous, uh, maybe right at the very end. Uh, so we're going to start our North America tour with the Ghost Ranch. Uh, and uh, this is Ghost Ranch area in the modern day here. <clears throat> so this is Ghost Ranch uh, in the present. Uh, it's currently a recreational retreat. So it's used for a lot of educational uh, and tours. Uh, and it's in kind of North Central New Mexico. <laughs> An interesting uh, fact about it is that uh, the original landowner 
uh, won the deed uh, in a poker game. <laughs> so uh, kind of neat how all this land changed hands as a result of a poker game. Uh, and this is actually Georgia O'Keeffe's house here, uh, the famous artist, Georgia O'Keeffe. Uh, she was very inspired by the beauty of the landscape. Uh, she called it the best place in the world. And she did a lot of uh, stills and uh, some of her skull paintings and stuff are actually from fossils in this area. So uh, I don't know if there's any art majors or artists in the class. I assume with 150 people, there's probably some. So if you're a Georgia O'Keeffe fan, there's lots to like here. In fact, uh, one of the, not dinosaurs, but the Pseudosuchians, the big walking crocs, uh, is actually named after her. So Iphigia O'Keeffe. Uh, is named after Georgia O'Keeffe, so uh, pretty interesting. But uh, you can see the beauty of the landscape here. Uh, beauty's in the eye of the beholder, though I, I tend to prefer a little bit more uh, green, <laughs> a little bit more vegetation, but it, it is a really beautiful landscape. Uh, so this is what it looks like at the present. Uh, what did it look like in the past? So this is a reconstruction of the Ghost Ranch area in the past. And so we see over here, you see the present day state margins are on here. Uh, obviously they weren't in their current positions. Remember that plate tectonics has moved things through time, but here's the four corners right here for reference. Uh, and so we're talking about kind of this area, mostly for Ghost Ranch, but uh, this is what it looked like at this time. And I'll explain how we know that in just a second, uh, but we've got the, uh, ocean margin over here, the Pacific Ocean, you'll notice that a lot of California is not even really there yet. Uh, that's going to get kind of pasted on a little bit later uh, as arcs collide with the west coast of North America. Uh, but the Ghost Ranch is very famous for these uh, Mesozoic rocks, and, it, and it's an entire suite of Mesozoic rocks that goes uh, all the way from Triassic to Jurassic to Cretaceous. Uh, for the purpose of today, we're going to focus on the Triassic, we're gonna look at the early Mesozoic rocks here. Uh, so these rocks consist of uh, river, lake, marsh, and sand dune deposits. And so when we're doing these paleo reconstructions, these uh, paleo environment maps, we're trying to reconstruct what these environments looked like in the past. And so how do we do that? How could you possibly map where the coastline was where a river was, where a lake or a swamp was uh, in the distant past, 230, 240 million years ago. Well, uh, it turns out that the rock record preserves a lot of those things. I'll talk more about that on the next slide. But another really cool thing uh, is that in this same formation uh, in Arizona <clears throat> is the petrified forest. Uh, you can see here some examples of those petrified logs. Uh, it's not wood anymore. It's been permineralized, so the minerals have been slowly replaced, or sorry, the wood has been slowly replaced by minerals. Uh, it's actually a big old slab of agate. Uh, it's solid rock, but it preserves the structure of the wood uh, almost perfectly. Uh, very neat uh, part of this formation here, but uh, this is a map reconstructed from painstaking field work uh, over this entire area, looking at uh, lots of details, and you see here lime, mud, sand, mud, sand, mud, sand, mud, sand, mud, sand, mud. Uh, looking at the distribution, volcanics, uh, looking at distribution of these rocks, you can start to put this map together. Uh, so the rocks of Ghost Ranch, the, the strata, the layers. So we talked earlier in the semester about kind of how to read the rock record. And I made the analogy that these rock layers, uh, you can see the layers here, uh, these strata are like pages in a book. Uh, it's the pages of the story of our planet, the pages of the story of life. And uh, the oldest rocks are on the bottom, and then younger rocks get deposited on top. Uh, and so if we were to walk up through one of these canyons here, we start at the bottom in old rocks, and we walk up and up and up. As we walk up, we're walking up through into younger and younger and younger and younger rocks. Uh, we're basically traveling through time. It's almost like a time machine. Uh, and because the present is the key to the past, uh, we can go look at modern 
features and see what their deposits look like. So for example, I told you that this area was lakes, rivers, uh, maybe some beaches and some of the later ones we're gonna talk about. How do we know that? Desert dunes, how do we know that? Well, if we look at the rocks, we see features that we can also see in modern rivers. So like if we go to a modern river and you dig a trench in the dirt around it, you're going to see a certain grain size distribution, certain geometries in the rocks. You might see a channel. So the, the scoop down of the river, the river is eroding down through the sediment around it. And you see this kind of scoop shape, this lens of different stuff. Uh, and it's a little bit higher energy than the other stuff. We talked earlier about, like, think about like a really big, really high velocity river, like the Niagara River. Niagara River is able to transport really big boulders. Uh, this river behind me here, uh, you could probably jump across it if you got a running start. Uh, that's not going to be able to transport big stuff. And so the grain sizes are smaller. So if we see like gravel size stuff, that means like high velocity or high wave energy. Uh, if you've ever been out near like Rudy's, uh, the diner out to the, the west of campus, uh, the beach along there is all gravel because the wave energy there is very high. Uh, if you go elsewhere, you might find that the beach is a little bit sandier or even a little bit muddier if the wave energy is lower. So we can look at grain size. We can also look at sedimentary structures. So like, for example, uh, here is a floodplain behind me. Uh, you see the little toes there uh, squishing down into the mud. It's going to leave a footprint. Uh, if you go look at modern river deposits, you can see like duck footprints and goose footprints all squished into the mud, the three toe foot, just like the dinosaurs. Present is the key to the past. We see mud on the floodplains now roots developing in there. We can see evidence of roots in the fossil record. When they dry out, you get those polygonal cracks. We can see those preserved in the rock record. And so by knowing what you're looking for, as a geologist, seeing the shape of the layers, the size of the grains, and the different structures that are available, you can reconstruct these environments. Uh, and so we're not just kind of making stuff up. Uh, to some degree, that's, that's interpretive. But uh, limestone has a significance. Limestone is a marine rock. Mudstone is fine grained. It forms in low energy environments. Siltstone's a little bit higher energy than that. Cross bedded sandstone is a little bit higher energy than that. Probably a river or possibly a beach. Conglomerate, even coarser grain kind of gravels. Uh, that's the significance of it's a strong high velocity uh, river. And so we can see these patterns uh, and we can make these uh, stratigraphic columns. Uh, so here's the late Triassic, the Chinle group. Uh, this is what we're going to be talking about, the dinosaurs of the Chinle group. But as I said before, Ghost Ranch records uh, things up into here, into the Jurassic. We'll talk about the Morrison a little bit later elsewhere uh, and then into the Cretaceous and ultimately into there. But uh, you see these grain sizes. It starts out coarser grained big blocky coarser grain uh, and then it gets quite uh, finer and finer grained calmer and calmer uh, deeper and deeper shell uh, water uh, and then you get these uh, little occasional pulses of sand which is probably a meandering river moving in and out of the environment and so you can read these rocks and reconstruct the past uh, let's look at the fauna so let's look at the critters that are around here uh, so this is dinosaurs class, Geo 105. Uh, hopefully you know that by now. <laughs> um, so primarily we've been interested in dinosaurs, but uh, at this time in the Triassic, uh, remember that this is the time of the very basal dinosaurs. Uh, dinosaurs are not yet a large and diverse group. Remember, uh, we haven't gotten to that late Triassic extinction yet. And so dinosaurs are still sort of living in the shadows of these big old Pseudosuchians, uh, the Rawasuchian walking croc carnivores, the phytosaurs, those weird alligator things with the nostrils sort of near the back, uh, the adosaurs, the big herbivorous reptiles. Uh, early on, we even have some of these leftover uh, dichinodonts, which are uh, more closely related to mammals. 
uh, or big herbivores. Uh, the only dinosaurs we have on this chart here, and they show up in both here, uh, Coelophysis, New York State's dinosaur. Uh, we don't have any bones here, but we have fossil footprints. Uh, these are found pretty frequently out here in New Mexico. Uh, we've got <clears throat> uh, Chindios, Chindiosaurus. Uh, that's another uh, one of these dinosaurs. Uh, Silosaur, another like very early uh, basal transitional dinosaur form. Uh, but we've still got the big old uh, walking crocs, so Postosuchus, this massive. Uh, again, it looks like a dinosaur. Uh, it even maybe moves a little bit like a dinosaur, but remember the hip socket is a little bit different. Some of these phytosaurs might resemble some of the herbivorous dinosaurs that come later, like Swoodlosaurus or some of the nodosaurs, uh, but they're more closely related to alligators and crocodiles. Uh, and uh, they're herbivorous, so herbivorous uh, crocodiles, that's kind of weird. Uh, but that's what's going on at the time here. You see uh, an example of kind of convergent evolution where you have the shoulder spikes in this particular one. Uh, so this is what the Chinle forming group uh, fauna uh, sort of looks like. It's still dominated by the pseudosuchians, the big walking croc rawasuchians, the phytosaurs and the adosaurs, and dinosaurs are a, a pretty small part of this. Uh, so what's the, some of the interactions of these? So uh, we've talked a lot about individual dinosaurs, individual groups, but uh, we haven't really gotten time to kind of dig into how they uh, relate with each other. Uh, but as you can see by that wide diversity of animals present, uh, the Chinle group is a very diverse uh, food web. And one thing that's a little bit weird is that it's, it's reptile dominated. Uh, there's a lot of different reptiles here filling all of the big herbivore, big carnivore roles. Uh, in this case, it's still the pseudosuchians, the false crocodiles. Uh, but later on, we're going to see that shift to dinosaurs. And there's, there's no really no modern equivalent to this. And this is why the Mesozoic is the age of reptiles, and whereas the Cenozoic is the age of mammals. These roles are filled by large mammals today, but the food web was very reptile dominated at this point. Uh, so what's going on? Uh, at this time. Well, uh, here is an adosaur, uh, one of those uh, herbivorous crocodiles. Uh, you saw that they were kind of armored and tank-like. Uh, this is one of the osteoderms, one of the bony plates in their skin. And you see the tooth marks on here. Uh, something was trying to eat it. Uh, what was trying to eat it? Well, uh, we have a bunch of possible culprits. Uh, so now we need to play a game of who done it. So the easiest way to figure that out is, you know, we have teeth from these carnivorous animals. Uh, which teeth fit uh, the tooth marks? Uh, which teeth fit the size? Which teeth fit the shape? Which teeth, uh, <laughs> teeth, which teeth uh, fit the spacing? And which did it? Uh, and so in here, in this case, uh, it looks like it was a phytosaur, so one of the crocodile uh, with the nostrils near the back, uh, trying to eat one of these adosaur uh, herbivorous uh, crocodilomorphs. Uh, and so it was a, a croc eat croc world at this point. Uh, so this is one of the phytosaurs, it's an adosaur here. Uh, Coelophysis running around, uh, you see relatively small body size. In fact, it was probably prey for some of these larger uh, crocodilomorphs. Uh, but again, it all changes at the end of the Triassic. Uh, in the table's turn, the dinosaurs become more diverse. The dinosaurs evolve towards larger body sizes. Uh, the crocodil, the crocodilomorph, the walking crocs, the bipedal crocs, uh, the phytosaurs, the adosaurs, those go extinct. Uh, but obviously, crocodiles and their relatives live on today. Uh, so, but uh, they kind of are much smaller than the dinosaurs in general, with some exceptions. Like if you remember back, uh, Dinosuchus is a pretty large uh, crocodilomorph that comes later. Uh, so that's the Chin Li uh, group or Chin Li formation. And again, we we're still not really into the age of dinosaurs. Uh, so let's go into the Morrison. So the Morrison is an, uh, one of these formations that we've talked about uh, quite frequently throughout the class, a lot of the dinosaurs that we talked about came from Morrison because the Morrison is Jurassic. 
uh, in age. Uh, and uh, Como Bluffs. Uh, Como Bluffs is Morrison Formation. Uh, that was, here's the Como Bluffs here today. You see the railway still goes across there. Uh, this was a major battleground in the Bone Wars. Uh, good old Cope and Marsh uh, going at each other. Uh, this is an area where there was some chicanery going on, uh, bribing the railway to transport their fossils and not the others, uh, maybe even blowing up quarries and things like that. So uh, this was one of the battlegrounds of the Bone Wars. Uh, and you see that uh, here's Dinosaur National Park, uh, this really cool uh, trackway. And you see that it's inclined. So the rocks are standing up on end a little bit. Uh, and so you're, wow, that's a pretty steep surface for those dinosaurs to walk up. Well, uh, if you think back to the geology lecture, uh, principle of original horizontality, uh, if you go to a river and there's a flood, the waters rise and the waters move across and the mud settles out into a flat layer. Sediments are deposited in flat layers. That's why if you see undisturbed sediments, uh, they're flat or really close to flat. Sediment layers are originally flat. Uh, if you see sedimentary layers that are up on their sides like this, it means they've been tilted. Uh, these rocks were tilted when the Rocky Mountains were uplifted, which happened uh, a little bit later on uh, during the Cenozoic. Um, so these prints were made while this was still squishy mud uh, in flat rocks along a riverbank. Uh, those rocks were lithified and then they were tilted uh, as the Rocky Mountains uplift. You see here's Red Rocks Park. Uh, these beds have been tilted on their side. They originally flat, the Rockies rose up and tilted them. Uh, red Rocks is very famous, like Garden of the Gods. Uh, those big red rocks that peek up out of the ground in those striking formations. Uh, this is uh, Dinosaur Ridge here, uh, and you see that it's tilted again with the dinosaur tracks in here. Um, so this is what the Morrison looks like at present. Uh, what did it look like in the past? So in going, again, hopping in the time machine, uh, reading what the rocks are telling us, reading those pages of geologic history, we're able to reconstruct the environment. So uh, this is the Morrison Formation here. Uh, kind of outlined, and this is a paleogeographic reconstruction. This is what it looked like at the time. You see that the Atlantic Ocean is uh, open. Uh, it's starting to separate on the South Atlantic as well. Uh, South America and Africa still are just barely rifting apart. Here's the paleo equator. Uh, here's 30 degrees north. Uh, 30 degrees north uh, and also 30 degrees south. Uh, today happen to be these large bands of desert areas. So like, for example, the Sahara, the Kalahari, the Gobi, uh, those are along uh, 30 degrees, uh, the Middle Eastern deserts. Those are along 30-ish degrees north of the equator. Uh, because of atmospheric circulation, there's falling air there, high pressure, not a lot of moisture. This was the same setup back in the Jurassic. Uh, also similar today, there's a ridge of mountains along the West Coast, not as we know it today, uh, but there's a ridge of mountains along here uh, and it has a rain shadow effect. The rain is blocked from here. And so uh, the Morrison Formation is pretty dry. Uh, we, the Ghost Ranch was a pretty uh, lush environment. This is pretty dry. It was a dry alluvial plain. So there's mountains over here on the west. Rivers are draining those mountains, bringing all that sediment. Uh, there's another highland see over here, the ancestral Rockies. Uh, sediments flow in this way. Uh, and then you see there's this little seaway that's starting to come in. Uh, when we get to the Cretaceous, that's going to really open up that uh, western Cretaceous interior seaway, but it's not yet really a thing. So the interior is still pretty dry here. Uh, but these rivers are kind of like corridors of life, and there's some scattered wetlands and lakes with probably rimming forests around it. Um, but what we see is sort of in the lower parts of this formation, we get desert dunes. Uh, again, how do we know? Go to a desert. What kind of features do we see? We see really well-sorted sand, uh, not a lot of mud, these big sweeping cross beds inside the dunes. That's what we see in the rock record. Present is the key to the past. 
uh, later on it transitions to more river dominated uh, and then eventually in the lakes and swamps. So there's kind of this general trend of uh, becoming a little bit cooler and a little bit wetter over time uh, during the Jurassic. Uh, and you also see that this is a pretty large area. Uh, some areas are drier, some areas are wetter, some areas are close to water, some are farther away. And so there's lots of varied environments and that results in a very varied fauna, a di very diverse fauna. Uh, and you see here, so an allosaur, uh, some kind of diplodocid there. Uh, and uh, you see kind of the different environments here. Uh, so let's look at the rocks themselves. So again, as the paleo environment changes, as we see that transition from dry, arid desert dunes to rivers, to even more rivers, to lakes, and finally shallow water, uh, the rocks change in response. And so that's what we see in the Morrison, are these, these big uh, cross-bedded sandstones, uh, and then they transition into these river sandstones, uh, and then into muds of like floodplains or lake deposits. Uh, and so again, we can look at the rocks, we can see these things. If you go to a modern river today, uh, in a lot of cases along the banks, you might see these ripples, uh, the ripples actually have, you can see the shallow side is kind of light. There's a steep side here in the shadow. Uh, we can tell that the river was flowing this way from left to right uh, as the current was moving across that. At the time, it was silt or mud. Uh, it made those ripple shapes and they've lithified into rock. Uh, we can still tell the direction that this river was flowing 180 million years later uh, by using uh, geologic, <laughs> our geologic knowledge of how these things work. Uh, you can also, again, see uh, these sloping cross beds here in the rocks. That tells us the direction that up is, because again, these rocks can be tilted and folded. It's important to be able to know which way up was. Uh, you can also tell the current direction off of here. Uh, and we can also see evidence of uh, mud cracks. So again, if you like go outside after it's rained and you see an area of like shallow mud, you might see little hexagonal kind of cracks in the mud, uh, kind of curl up at the sides, uh, because as the mud dries, it shrinks and it cracks. Those cracks are preserved in the rock record too, and so we know this was a muddy floodplain that dried up. Uh, and so we're able to read the rocks. If you know what you're looking for, it's kind of like a forensic investigation. Uh, all these clues are left behind uh, to someone that is not trained to see them. Uh, it's just rocks. But when you know what you're looking for, it tells a story. Uh, and that story is in the context of all the other things around it. Uh, and you can really reconstruct the entire past environment here. Uh, this picture behind me, this uh, paleo reconstruction, uh, it's informed by this evidence in the rocks, just like the reconstructions of the animals is informed by interpreting the fossil record. So we can read the rock record in addition to the fossil record and really get a whole idea of what this environment and this system looked like. Uh, let's take a look at the dinosaurs of the Morrison Formation because that's why we're here, right? Uh, so these are the non-sauropods of the Morrison Formation. And we've seen this figure before. Uh, we've referred to it several times here. Uh, so the dominant carnivores of the Morrison, uh, Allosaurus is the dominant one by far, represents about 70 to 75 percent of the carnivorous dinosaur remains uh, in the group. Uh, Epentarius and Sauropaginax are probably just slightly larger versions uh, of Allosaurus. Uh, we also see Ceratosaurus here, uh, a little bit smaller, a little bit more slender version. Uh, it's one of the Ceratosaurians, uh, obviously it's named Ceratosaurus. Uh, Torvosaurus is one of the Megalosaurs with, you see the longer snout here, longer skinnier snout, a little bit slender body. Uh, and remember we were talking about like the kind of stockier, stouter Allosaurus was probably taking on larger prey. It was probably also hunting in the more open environments like the floodplains. Uh, Torvosaurus and Ceratosaurus are a little bit smaller, a little bit more spindly, uh, able to move around a little bit better uh, in tight quarters. They're probably hunting 
uh, in the forested areas. So we see sort of this niche diversification. So how do all of these different carnivorous dinosaurs exist together? Uh, they weren't hunting the same prey items and they weren't hunting in the same places. Uh, same thing goes for the herbivores. So we've got uh, stegosaurs, two different kinds of stegosaurs. We've got a very early basal hadrosaur. Uh, you see it doesn't really have the duck bill yet. Uh, a very upright stance, not using the front legs for quadrupedality. Uh, we see later on the larger duck bills uh, being down onto their hands. Uh, that hasn't happened yet. Uh, we see uh, in uh, early uh, nodosaurid here, Gargoylosaurus, one of the very early uh, forms here. Uh, this is kind of representing that start of that transition from uh, the very advanced stegosaurs. We're starting to see the mantle get passed over to the ankylosaurs here uh, at the Morrison Formation. Uh, so just uh, very interesting how diverse the fauna is here. Uh, if we look at the herbivorous sauropods of the Morrison Formation, uh, you see that there's just so many different ones. Uh, and it's been a little bit of an outstanding question of like, uh, how many herbivorous different dinosaurs can this environment actually support? Uh, why are there so many different kinds here? Uh, also, one thing to note, keep in mind the scale, this, this person here is about twice as small as the one on the previous slide. So uh, you see, here's the person here. They always have to wave. I don't know why they're waving, <laughs> but hey. Uh, so these, these are actually about twice as big compared to those other dinosaurs as they look on here. So remember, sauropods are just you know, truly massive. Uh, Amphiocelus would dwarf a um, Allosaurus, Brachiosaurus even would dwarf an Allosaurus. These are just you know, colossal uh, sauropods, <laughs> uh, just some of, again, some of the largest animals to ever live on land in the whole history. Uh, so why are there so many different ones? Well, uh, it's kind of interesting. You see the grid blocks on the background uh, if you start counting grid blocks uh, from like their feet up to their neck, uh, what you'll notice is that uh, there's actually a pretty wide diversity of where the head is located. Uh, these reconstructions are, uh, in theory, uh, kind of their resting position where the neck would be. Uh, Brachiosaurus may be a little bit more upright than this. Uh, but there's kind of two body forms here. There's the diplodocids with the really long whip-like tail. And you see that their bodies are oriented kind of mostly horizontal. Uh, and then there's the big uh, titanosaurs like uh, Brachiosaurus. Uh, and you see that it has larger front limbs. Uh, that's why it's called Brachiosaurus, the arm lizard, because the large front lizard kind of gives it this lean, this tilt. Uh, and the neck and body are kind of tilted backwards. Uh, Chimerosaurus, another example of this. Uh, but if you measure, the height from feet to, to, to snout, uh, you're gonna see that there's a lot of different numbers here. Uh, there's some forms that are eating things two blocks off the ground. Here's eating three blocks off the ground. Here's four blocks off the ground. Here's five blocks off the ground. Here's, uh, that's a lot, eight blocks. Here's, I don't know, nine probably. Uh, they're all eating at different heights, uh, which means that they're probably also eating different things. Uh, so again, this is an example of niche partitioning. Uh, they're not directly competing with each other. Uh, Amphiocelus is eating things that these other dinosaurs cannot reach. Uh, and so it's not competing with them. It doesn't matter. Uh, this thing's eating things on the ground that this dinosaur can't reach without causing a lot of problems. Uh, so they're not competing with each other. Uh, it's also likely that they in inhabited slightly different environments. Uh, so that kind of opens up the space a little bit too, but uh, it's just very interesting to see all this diversity here. Uh, when there's resources to be had, life finds a way and it diversifies into ideal body forms to exploit those resources. And this is what we see with all this diversity within the Morrison Formation. And uh, obviously this isn't every one of these dinosaurs. We haven't found all of them. Uh, so it, it's probably even more complicated than this. So what are they doing? How are they interacting with each other? Uh, again, quite, quite complex, uh, multi-layered food web. Uh, there's lots of interactions between these different species. Uh, Allosaurus here, uh, the dominant predator. 
uh, was it taking on Stegosaurus? So uh, there are some other of those herbivores, like say the Camptosaurus, the, the Hadrosaur, the, the early duckbill. Uh, it doesn't have spikes, it doesn't have plates, uh, a little bit less defended. So that's probably what they usually ate. Uh, but would an Allosaurus go after a Stegosaurus? Uh, probably they would wanna, again, try to separate out the weak, separate out the old, separate out the young, uh, but uh, at least one Allosaurus uh, messed around with a Stegosaurus that it shouldn't have, uh, and it got gored with the tail spike Phagomizers uh, right in the, the pelvis. Uh, you can see the entry wound here. Uh, how do we know that it's from a Stegosaur Thagomizer? Again, that's like a whodunit, uh, just like we can match the caliber of bullets with uh, wounds and try to reconstruct the forensics of that. Uh, we can reconstruct the entrance hole with spikes and with teeth, uh, known material, and what fits it. Uh, this is the entrance wound, uh, and you can see that uh, it actually caused a big pocket of bone here to actually disintegrate that was infected. Uh, it became an abscess. This is probably what killed the Allosaurus uh, from this festering wound uh, in its pelvis area. Uh, and so, again, like, uh, was Allosaurus hunting Stegosaurus? Uh, it definitely happened. It happened at least once. Uh, definitely didn't happen again for this particular one because it didn't make it. Uh, it might not have been the infection that killed it, but it did die shortly thereafter because there's no evidence that this really started to heal. Um, also, we find numerous big bones, big fossils. So this is a big humerus from uh, one of the sauropod dinosaurs. Uh, with uh, bite marks along here, you see these teeth marks on here. Uh, and again, the question is, who done it? Uh, it's like an ancient murder mystery. It's a the 150, 60, 70 year old cold case. Uh, who did it? How could we possibly know? Well, we have teeth, we have jaws, we have claws, we have all of these different material from these carnivorous dinosaurs. And you just kind of match up. There's a very distinctive spacing of these gouges, there's a very distinctive kind of V-shape to these gouges uh, that matches, happens to match up with uh, Allosaurus teeth, uh, which is not unexpected, like we would expect Allosaurus to be here. Uh, now the big question is, uh, are these from something that the Allosaurus killed, or is it from the Allosaurus scavenging this after it was dead? Uh, that's a little harder to tell. Uh, if we see healing on the bone, definitely it was an attack while it was alive, but didn't actually bring it down. But uh, if it's the fossil, uh, it's very hard to tell if these are the wounds that killed it uh, or if it's from scavenging it after it's dead. Uh, so that's the Morrison formation. Uh, I'm not going to go into detail on Egg Mountain and the two medicine formation, but we did mention it earlier. Uh, it's a late Cretaceous outcrop. Uh, so it's not quite as old. The next formation we're going to go to is Hell Creek, which is at the very end of the Cretaceous. But I just want to mention this because uh, this is one of the best sites on Earth for dinosaur eggs and dinosaur nests. Uh, there's been 14 hadrosaur nests, so myosaur, the, the carrying mother lizard, uh, with uh, eggs, with embryos, with juveniles, all through the whole growth stages. Uh, and also, we're able to reconstruct the growth history from there. Uh, probably reached maturity in eight to 10 years. So from this tiny little hatchling to the massive adult uh, in only eight to 10 years. And again, that's pretty good evidence for that really strong, quick growth rate of the dinosaurs, uh, kind of incompatible with a cold-blooded lifestyle. So pointing towards uh, at least mesothermic, if not uh, warm-blooded. Uh, and then we also see that uh, they were together. Uh, there's clear evidence of parenting things that are too large to just be hatchlings uh, still on the nest. They're juveniles still being looked after. We see trackways, we see massive bone beds indicating a full range of different size and maturity individuals traveling together uh, in the same direction, a good indicator of herding and possibly even migrating. Uh, but this is Egg Mountain uh, in the present day here. Uh, it's just kind of a little mountain here and it has eggs, that's why they call it that. Uh, that's really the two medicine formation. And here's an example of some fossilized dinosaur eggs. Uh, well, now let's go look at the last one we're gonna talk about today, the Hell Creek formation. 
Uh, so we talked about Chinle formation from the Triassic, Morrison formation from the Jurassic, Egg Mountain two medicines from kind of later Cretaceous. This is from the late East Cretaceous. Uh, and the outcrop here is in Badlands area of Montana, the Dakotas, and Wyoming. This is going to be a trend that we kind of see quite frequently is that a lot of these dinosaur fossil beds are in areas of Badlands. Uh, we saw the area around the Morrison and Ghost Ranch was relatively arid and open too and relatively unvegetated. Uh, so why is that? Well, uh, really it's kind of coincidental. Uh, the modern climate and the ancient climate are not necessarily related with each other in any way. Uh, it's 66, at least 66 million years ago, and so the climate can change radically over that point. The thing that it is, though, is if you're trying to find dinosaur bones, dinosaur bones are relatively rare. You need lots of rock, lots of exposure to have any chance of finding anything. Uh, if you start trying to look for large rock outcrops around here in New York State, uh, it's difficult. Uh, doing field geology in New York State is tricky because there's not a lot of outcrop. Uh, if you go up to Tug Hill Plateau, you start seeing large outcrops of limestones and things like that. Go to Lakeshore here, you see some Oswego sandstone. Uh, start driving south of here, and most of it's glaciated. Uh, it's covered in dirt. It's covered in vegetation. Uh, the glaciers have stripped away a lot of stuff. Uh, it's a lot easier to do geology out west because you can see a lot more. Uh, it's just much more likely that we find dinosaurs out here. Uh, even if the rocks around here were rich in dinosaur fossils, which they're not because they're Paleozoic in age uh, before the dinosaurs, uh, only in very southern New York, down near the city, uh, in that Newark province, do we see dinosaur aged rocks and only then a very little. Uh, even if they existed, we wouldn't be able to find them because there's very little rock around here. It's really difficult to do this. Uh, but the Hell Creek is very fascinating because uh, it literally records the last minutes of the dinosaurs. Uh, it, in some places, the uh, KPG boundary is the upper limit of this uh, Hell Creek formation. Uh, and so we go all the way up to the last gasp. Uh, in fact, so here's Hell Creek formation. Here's the KPG layer. Here's the boundary clay. Uh, the boundary clay is enriched in iridium, that element that's not found on Earth or rarely found on Earth uh, and is found pretty commonly in extraterrestrial objects. Then there's a layer of spherules, uh, that stuff raining down out of the sky, uh, kind of a coal layer here from all the dead vegetation uh, after the mass extinction. Uh, and then we start to see burrows, things that life is like rebounding. Uh, and then we get full up into the, the, the paleogene, uh, life starts recovering. Um, but yeah, this is what the Hell's Creek looks like. Uh, it's called Hell Creek for a reason. It's a pretty inhospitable place, uh, and that's a theme that we'll see in a lot of these. And dinosaur digs are often in places where you don't have a lot of vegetation, don't have a lot of water, uh, and those are pretty harsh conditions for field work. Uh, so what does it look like in the past? Uh, sort of almost uh, the opposite of that. It wasn't an arid badlands at all. Uh, in fact, it was a pretty lush uh, shoreline. Uh, at this point, uh, the West Cretaceous Sea uh, is receding already, so uh, it's sort of slowly drying up. Uh, but there's shoreline here. Uh, Hell Creek Formation is located kind of down here. Uh, it's along this shoreline of this West Cretaceous Interior Seaway that's slowly disappearing. So these dry, arid badlands uh, was actually a very hospitable beachfront property. Uh, during the Cretaceous. Uh, and again, we see that slowly fade away. And then by the time we get into the Cenozoic, it's gone. Uh, and we never again have water uh, seas intruding into the interior of our continent. Uh, but you see, this is a pretty good reconstruction of what life looked like here. Uh, lots of water, lots of beach area with shallow shoreline, uh, pretty lush, uh, in some cases, probably forested. Uh, we see some uh, dromaeosaurs here, the quote unquote raptors. Uh, turtles, uh, we often don't think about turtles, lizards, snakes, and stuff being around, but they are around during the Mesozoic. Uh, they're just not dominant. They're not char as charismatic as dinosaurs. We don't really talk about them. Uh, and then, of course, T. rex uh, is around in this Hill Creek formation as well. Some of our favorite triceratops, uh, some smaller carnivores here. 
uh, big old pterodactyl, or I should say pterosaur, uh, flying in the air here. Remember, pterosaurs had that trend towards larger body sizes, larger head crests, uh, large flying dinosaur here. Uh, again, how do we know that? Look at the rocks. The rocks tell you what the rocks tell you the story if you know what you're looking for. So, how do we know that that seaway was there? Because we see a mixture of freshwater and brackish water, sort of salty er, not as salty as seawater, but salty er, uh, water, clays, and mudstones. Again, the significance of clay and mud is that it's fine grained, low energy, it's slack water. There's not a lot of movement, there's not a lot of motion, there's not a lot of energy to carry larger grains. Uh, but in river channels, we see that we do. So uh, it's kind of hard to see, but this is, uh, you see the rocks here, there's this kind of cut down here uh, and it has conglomerate, it has really coarse gravel inside of it. Uh, that's a river channel. Uh, so just like behind me here, the river incises down in, there's a river valley, there's a stream channel uh, that gets filled in with material from the stream and it's different from the stuff on the sides. You see floodplain muds, off on the side. So how do we know there was a river here? We can literally see it uh, in the outcrop. Uh, again, it's pretty subtle. If you don't know what you're looking for, it's hard to see, uh, but we can see that. Uh, we also see that those rivers eventually meet the sea and we get delta deposits. We also see kind of swampier muds. Uh, some areas have pollen and spores associated with like uh, conifers, so larger trees, ferns, shrubs, maybe thickly forested. Uh, and again, this diversity of environments supports a diversity of life. Uh, looking for large carnivores here though, uh, well, there's T-Rex, okay. Um, uh, Dakota Raptor is pretty big. Uh, there's sort of this gap in between from like Dakota Raptor up to T-Rex. And again, uh, that hypothesis is that there's not a lot of medium sized carnivorous dinosaurs uh, the smaller rolls are filled by these raptors, uh, and the large rolls filled by T-Rex. The medium rolls filled by uh, developing young T-Rexes. Uh, so uh, uh, we remember the story of the Pachycephalosaurus, how uh, Dracorex, Stigmolic, and Pachycephalosaurus got separated out as three different species. It's probably actually three different growth stages. Uh, Nano Tyrannus is probably another growth stage of Tyrannosaurus, uh, hunting different things due to their different sizes. The large herbivores here, we got Triceratops uh, and another Ceratopsian Taurosaurus. Uh, we've got an Ankylosaurus with the tail club here. Uh, we've got a Nodosaur, Edmontia, and we've got the big old Edmontosaurus, the Hadrosaur, uh, advanced duckbill dinosaur, walking on four legs with the actual duckbill. Uh, so we got a lot of diversity here, uh, the last of the really large pterosaurs here. Uh, again, all kinds of different body plans, different diversity, filling different roles. Uh, how do they interact with each other? Well, uh, again, behavior and food web reconstruction is a bit difficult when all you have is the hard parts, uh, but we see bite marks on a lot of those large herbivorous bones. Who did it? <laughs> Where did those bite marks come from? Uh, what did you do, you naughty T-Rex? Uh, so uh, if we look at this hadrosaur jawbone, we can tell it's a hadrosaur because we see that battery of teeth. Again, those really advanced chewing teeth that replace each other over time. Uh, you see this big gouge here on the bone that cuts all the way across. You see some other gouges here that lead into this fractured uh, boundary here. Uh, that fracture happened before it was fossilized. This bone was crushed before it was fossilized, and these teeth happen to match up with T. rex's teeth. Uh, here is a triceratops rib, and again, the spacing and the shape match up with Tyrannosaurus teeth. Uh, so Tyrannosaurus was eating these creatures. Uh, again, how often would it take on a full-grown hadrosaurus? Uh, hadrosaurs don't really have as many defenses as, say, a, a ceratopsian does, uh, but they're still just big. They're formidable. Uh, ceratops was maybe a little bit more formidable, uh, so they maybe shied away from that. Again, maybe targeting the younger, the older, the sick, uh, but certainly at some point they were eating it. Uh, and then there's always this big question of, is T-Rex an active hunter or is T-Rex a scavenger? 
uh, with just these bite marks, it's very difficult to tell. Uh, did T-Rex take down this animal or did it eat it after it was dead? Uh, and again, we see these smaller dinosaurs present uh, T-Rex probably didn't even bother with those. Uh, a pachycephalosaur is barely a morsel for a T-Rex. So um, that was probably being pursued by some of those smaller carnivorous dinosaurs. Again, niche partitioning. They're not competing with each other. Everything has its job, everything has its role. And there's a diversity of roles, which makes a diversity of body plans, a diversity of dinosaurs. Uh, and just, reconstructing those is you know one of the points of paleontology uh that's all i've got for today hope you enjoyed that and i will see you next time goodbye